All right, this is an Inside Jerry's Brain call on Monday, the 1st of June, 2020. We are toward the end of lockdown and the beginning of possibly the meltdown of the United States. I'm not quite sure, but there are protests in the streets. Things are looking, things are looking really grim. Um, and we're, we're here because I posted a couple of videos about uh, the subprime crisis. And I was trying to diagnose why, you know, why did it happen? Uh, and what, what have we learned from it? What have we done? And Richard, uh, having seen those, sent back a really nice question, which is awesome that, you know, awesome that there's this thesis about SNP that we've cut relationships. Um, how might we mend if, since we're using the metaphor of the fabric of society and the fabric of long-term relationships and all that, how might we mend this? And uh, just, uh, just by way of introduction, Richard, if you want to say a little bit uh, to, about yourself uh, as we head into the call, but. Uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, I'll, I'll wait for the appropriate time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so then if you want to just uh, riff a little bit on what your thoughts were and, and uh, where you work, and, and then I can sort of take us into what, what yeah. I was thinking as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, uh, the thing that hit into my, came into my head was the, the, the interdependency of relationships across societies. And, and, and there was ob that obviously rendered a tear <laughs> somewhere quite significant. Um, and, but we haven't really looked at the, I guess, the ripple effect well enough. Um, as, as to what it's actually causing in, in, in various different aspects of societies. And then there's, a, there's a, an academic called Peter Fleming who uses the metaphor of a, of a tidal wave. Uh, so I think, he, I think the book is, he does it in, is The Death of Homo Economus. Um, mm -hmm. And it, he, he basically suggests we're in stage four of the tidal wave. So I can't remember what the, the various other stages are, but so, so the, the financial crisis, you had the, the early warnings, uh, sort of the fish flopping around on the beach, and, and then you had the, the build up of the wave, and then you had the wave crashing down with all the destruction. And his, his current metaphor is we're now seeing the wave pull back and it's just leaving sludge everywhere. And we're, we're sort of wading through the sludge trying to find bits of value. Um, but, but really it's a dirty and, 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 and disgusting job. Um, so that, that, you know, that it's a metaphor that is quite powerful, but perhaps it doesn't give you much hope. Mm -hmm. I think, that, I think the snipping, the snipping metaphor is a bit more hopeful is that, that it gives you the opportunity to retie relationships and, and start doing something. Um, but it, it's just, it's very easy to write the critique. It's less easy to... <laughs> As <laughs> as always, right? Time to bring that together again. Yeah. As always in human history, and it, yeah. it's funny because uh, you know plans are worthless, but planning is useful. Uh, everybody has a plan until a fi you know their mouth hits a fist or whatever it was that Mike Tyson said. Mm. Uh, there's a, a bunch of interesting sayings, but but trying to sort out why things happened, I find absolutely fascinating, and I have found alternative explanations of historic events to be truly fascinating to the point of which. I'm like, oh, why does nobody see it this way? This, this really, mm -hmm. if you can shift your perspective on why things happened, it explains a lot of things. And explanatory mm -hmm. power <clears throat> is a lovely thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're all looking for things that have explanatory power, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then on the repair front, uh, in particular with social systems, anything that involves human beings who are these squishy, uh, you know, bags of water held together with a little bit of protein and, and lint or, or duct tape or something like that, um, it's hard to predict or cause anything to happen. And there, and what's happening right now in the United States is violence is happening and the police are responding by turning the knob to 11. They're basically upping the violence instead of, mm -hmm. instead of realizing that there are other ways to deescalate and that, and that the problems are systemic, et cetera. So I think, and I have a funny feeling just because of the heat of, of the moment of, <clears throat> of the protests that we're going to sort of switch back and forth between subprime uh, retrospective and, and fixing and what's happening in society right now with policing and fixing because they're, they're actually really related. Um, and so, and so uh, my approach to all this was that there were all these little long-term relationships and responsibilities that were holding things together uh, mm -hmm. and we're doing a reasonable job of it back when. Uh, things like, you know, holding assets for a long time once, once you made a loan, uh, things like having your reputation and your own money on the line for a long time and that those things were all systematically taken away. And so, and, and since this is a, this, these calls are called Inside Jerry's Brain, let me do a little uh, screen sharing uh, of my brain. 
and take us back into that section <clears throat> just so we can kind of pick up the plot where it was. And this is the, 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 the complicated section where I was trying to summarize the different kinds of long-term relationships that we snipped. Mm -hmm. And so we snipped uh, bankers uh, and investors responsibility for long-term outcomes, <clears throat> right? So lenders used to know their clients and all of a sudden we, we sort of delaminated. And this is where I hadn't heard the term vertical disintegration before. I had clearly heard about vertical integration, but what happens when an industry goes from being vertically integrated to, to being slivers of value being pulled out of it is called vertical disintegration. So, uh, and here's an article uh, from 2005, uh, sort of examining what, you know, how and why markets uh, emerged in mortgage, in mortgage banking and how that all worked. So partly, um, partly the work of, the work of severing all these relationships was kind of patient and long-term in the sense of many of these things took a really long time. Like you don't take an industry like banking and, and convert its very structure overnight and you don't do it through one order or one thing. Um, so in order to get back toward other, other kinds of things, you, you need, you need to put some mechanisms in place or laws in place that motivate people to do something different. And that, so, so I mean, I just, I'll just touch a couple things here and then, and then come back into the conversation. But then I, I also have a thought here, lessons from SNP and finance. And this was the, the third video was not just lessons, but you know, what might we do? And this area, these are, these are my lessons from it, but then I, I don't have a lot under what ought we have done after the global financial crisis. Mm. I just don't. <clears throat> and one, <clears throat> One of my conclusions is uh, we should have just rebooted Moody's, Fitch, and Standard and Poor's. Um, and it turns out that we don't have a lot of recourse, uh, that what they did doesn't run afoul of a whole bunch of laws, and it's unclear whom they're responsible to and how this whole thing actually works. Uh, another thing is reinstating Glass-Steagall. And there was an earnest effort by Elizabeth Warren, John McCain, and others to do that in 2013, which failed, right? Um, and so, so I'm, I, <clears throat> I'm interested in what, um, what, other, what other ways you would see the kinds of things we would, uh, we could reinstate. So what have they, what have they done? Um, what actually, what actually have you seen done that was positive, Jerry? So they Anyone did else? pass, so they did pass uh, some legislation. There was a, yeah, certainly there was TARP and there was a bunch of, uh, uh, of emergency uh, aid passed and then there were some laws passed, but the laws were quickly weakened. And the, the, basically the, here it is, to the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010, which happens after the meltdown under, under Obama. Uh, it's led by Chris Dodd and Barney Frank. Um, and it leads to the formation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And you may have followed this, but Elizabeth Warren was essential in the creation of that bureau. And then she was possibly going to lead it. And there was objection to that. Uh, so uh, they put a fellow named Richard Cordray in charge. And then they basically, I think, from my, my understanding, defanged it. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically uh, took, pr progressively managed to um, get rid of whatever power it had uh, over control. So... And, I'm, and I, again, I'm no finance expert and um, I'm walking around here picking up evidence and trying to you know, glue the evidence together to, to demonstrate how it all connected. Uh, systemically important financial institutions get extra scrutiny. Uh, that's, that was sort of a review of the Dodd-Frank uh, Reform Act. Um, here's an article from the Wall Street Journal uh, about, you know, there was a movement to repeal Dodd-Frank. Donald Trump plans to undo the Dodd-Frank law and fiduciary rule, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So then they passed the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act in 2018, which weakened Dodd-Frank. So like that. And, and, and it's, it's actually really frustrating because I'm, partly what frustrates me here is that <clears throat> um, there was really no safe harbor from this disaster. There were very few people who avoided it. And I think, I think the moment where I got that was when I read, um, uh, I read this article, it's The Economy Doomkopf by Michael Lewis. And it's, uh, it was in Vanity Fair. Uh, 
and he he very cutely ha riffs on Germany's obsession with shit because mm -hmm. th there is that. Um, but then he talks about this little um, IKB Deutsche Industriebank, which was this little fund uh, up in northern Germany, which went bust because they had invested in CDOs and CDSs, etc. And I realized that that the the breaking of Glass Siegel, the um, uh, linking together of everybody in uh, in one big bucket uh, basically made it so that you, your old savings bank was no longer a good old conservative savings bank. It was just as likely to be affected by this whole thing. And one of, one of, one of my lessons from this whole disaster is that uh, savvy investors love volatility. Like, you know, I went, to, I went to business school and you talk about beta and volatility and all that. And you kind of have this idea that volatility is a bad thing that you're trying to dampen volatility because you want growth to be regular and stable. Savvy investors don't want predictable, stable growth. Predictable is really bad. They want swings. And if you can get everybody to pool their money on the swing and then catch the swings right, you win big. Like that, that's how you go home happy that you've conquered the, you know, you're the master of the universe. You've conquered the world's financial system. And I'm being a little, a little cynical here, but, but the whole set of experiences around the subprime crisis and then the global financial crisis made me go there, right? Um, and I'll, I'll let me let me hit pause for a second and see how this reflects your own your own experience of it or reflections on it. I, I certainly agree with the the loving volatility thing. I mean, I think that's that's one of the I, I guess the the major challenges of the SNPs is that you're the the actual the fake or, or, or the expectations market and, and the actual market have been totally disconnected because the expectations market wants volatility and the actual market wants stability. Um, and I, I would assume behind the scenes, there's an awful lot of, uh, of stuff going on to try and make it volatile so people can make money. Exactly. Um, and with that kind of disconnect, then you're in a, you're in a very tricky position. The only way, I guess the only way you can, deal with it is is what people something like um uh roger l martin's trying to do which is cast uh try and argue that, that the expectations market needs to be reconfigured so that it doesn't do this kind of thing and, and or the long-term stock exchange as well long term yeah and, and the long-term stock exchange right so that so that the value is actually based on the real stuff that companies are doing I think you've had a little, uh, you're getting beginning signals that that, that is the case. Because I think that, you know, the, the big, what's going on at the moment, you're going to have um, the unicorns collapsing, which were, which were growth focused and, and it is how you make your, your, your masses. And there's, a, there's certainly an argument there that, that there's going to be a shift away from growth to, to, to value uh, mm -hmm. for the investors trying to invest in that kind of thing. So there's some kind of, discussion going on between the various different points around uh, what investment or good investment should look like right. um, but it, it's clashing with a i guess it's even clashing i guess it's even clashing with the software that these guys use which are just looking for yeah, sort of lo looking for volatile signals and, and 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 doing it without even the traders necessarily being involved um right, right. so there's a black box element i think as well Exactly. And here's uh, Roger Martin's book. I, didn't, I have not read this book, but Fixing the Game, Bubble Strategies, and What Capitalism Can Learn from the NFL. That's interesting. It's very good. It's and he talks good. about stock prices are just like point spreads in football. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he argues the real market is, is, can be doing extremely well. But if it doesn't match what, what the spread suggests, um, the company doesn't get the, the, the capital that it's after. The stock price will go down. Right. Uh, um, right. So it doesn't really measure uh, real value in real the value. market. Yeah. Well, I remember also when I was in business school, I went to a lecture where a guy who was a world class accountant, <clears throat> uh, sort of corporate value accountant, he did an analysis of Coca Cola. And he said, here's the book value of Coca Cola. I've gone deep. I, I counted everything. I went all over the place. And he could account for two thirds of Coca Cola's market value as book value. And he, said, yeah. and he pointed to the third. He pointed to the rest of the other third. And he said, this is just a mystery. This is goodwill. We put this in the big bucket of goodwill. We, you know, if we're trying to assess the, the market value and, and give it some name or some identity, we put this into this weird bucket called goodwill or something else. And um, 
that was kind of not very helpful. And, and so there's this huge disconnect between actual value being created on the ground and what the markets are doing. Um, and what's weird is that when, when lockdown hit and the stock market plunged faster and deeper than ever before, uh, nobody expected it to have at least a short-term V recovery because mm -hmm. it, just, it just started climbing immediately. Um, partly, I think, because uh, the investors who can swing markets really love volatility. And the fact that all the air had gone out so quickly was a major shopping event. Um, and, and I don't know, I think we're still, on, we're still on a precipice as far as I can tell. I mean, even, even, even our, my local investment with my wife is just focused on once there's a swing in prices, which stocks look undervalued. Right, everybody goes bottom <laughs> feeding. Yeah, well, it's not, even, it's not necessarily bottom feeding, it's just here's, here's the spikes. And, and it might impact somebody, somebody somewhere else. So she just looks at under what stocks that she thinks are historically undervalued rather than waiting for it to hit the bottom. Um, so okay. she just looks at where, you know, as the, as the, the turbulence is hit, oh, this company seems very un undervalued at the moment. So it's worth worth investing in because they actually, and so, so she does do the, the, the sort of the market value, you know, what she thinks market value is versus expectations. And it yeah. works re reasonably well. We make, we make, reasonable amount of money out of it um but that's not what the big guys do right they they even try and create this the right. volatility um, they have they have enough heft that they can shift markets yeah. to cause I the think, kinds I of waves so. they want it's like a, it's like so. a wave making pool you know they have yeah. the energy they have the energy to make the big waves uh, there's another thing that was connected to that book to fixing the game which was the, the dumbest idea in the world, maximizing shareholder value, a post in Forbes by Steve Denning. But this whole, one of the contributors here is this notion that maximizing shareholder value is okay. Uh, and, you know, and here I've got two thoughts opposite each other. I've got defenders of maximizing uh, shareholder value. Here's an, here's an article from The Economist. These are actually both from The Economist, um, which is coming around by the way. And then here's a bunch of articles, uh, critiques of, of this whole notion of, of shareholder value. And then that's coupled a lot with executive, exorbitant executive compensation, which I have as well in there. And, and these are kind of like bad ideas humming in the background, informing all the other decisions that are being made in these systems in different ways. So again, this is sort of, you've got Martin's work pop, popping in here as well, because Martin argues that, that shareholder value is a real problem and you should focus on customer delight. Yep. Uh, and, and John Kay's work is incredibly important in this space. Uh, his work on obliquity. Um, oh, oblique strategies, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that actually, yeah, obliquity and indirect way to success. <laughs> that, that you're, that, that, that's a critique of, share, of the shareholder value, that if you take the shareholder value as a target, um, you actually will start stop delivering shareholder value if you take it uh, if it's the, at the focus point if you actually focus on the oblique stuff mm -hmm. you're going to deliver shareholder value so you do the other stuff and you you create shareholder value but you don't focus on shareholder value as the be all and end all it's it's a it's a byproduct it's a byproduct so i think i think you've got people like martin and um john k and then there's a the the valueism so the strategic management forum in the uk and their care concept of valueism which is all all arguing around how we rethink value um so hmm. pull, pull, pull don't have them it. no you probably wouldn't they don't have really, them. i should they i'm really, embarrassed they only really <clears throat> operate in the uk so they do they they work they, they run a whole bunch of sort of hbr events around strategy and value and so they have a concept called valueism um uh, they haven't written their book yet. I've just met them a few times. Oh, interesting. So they're new. He's been the guy that runs it, Paul Barnett, has been around for a long time. Um, he used to run. He used to run head, head the strategic planning forum and changed it to the. I'm misspelling it. That's part of my problem here. Yeah, there you go. That's him. You've got a picture of him. So he's, he's sort of been around the world speaking about yep. it. So he's trying to. I guess trying to create a methodology of, of putting all of this stuff together, mm -hmm. um, but because it's you know, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff on on LinkedIn because it's so non mainstream. Wow, interesting. I'll, um, I'll, I'll research. But he's quite big in the, the sort of the, the the strategic thinkers in in the UK, and um, they all he sort of they run some really interesting events. Uh, he's part of the Drucker Forum and stuff like that. So they they all work together. That's super interesting. 
So I'm adding, I'm adding valueism to my favorite, one of my favorite thoughts in my brain, just <laughs> called, just called <laughs> isms. <clears throat> so autodidacticism, behaviorism, assholeism, anti-Semitism, anti-positivism, uh, anti-Americanism, etc. And so here's valueism, which I will connect up to value. <clears throat> How about casinoism? Uh, is there such a, a movement? Why not? It's Why not? On. No, ser seriously. Um, yeah, I, I don't. It's a, just a. I mean, I'm I'm hearing this conversation, and I'm wondering. Why are we surprised? I do have casino capitalism as a variant what of capitalism. What else is it? Yeah. I mean, um, and who's running the game? Who runs house here? Right. Um, volatility improves the, um, the opportunity for the players who've got the, uh, the tools to make it work. Um, I, I don't know. This is probably familiar to uh, you, Richard, the, the great money trick. Remember no, that? I, haven't read that. I haven't read that one. It's uh, Robert Tressel, the mm. uh, ragged trousered philanthropist. Okay, yeah, I've read that, yeah. Yeah, well, this is the core of it. It's basically the, the capitalist will employ the worker until the capitalist has enough asset, and then the capitalist closes down the plant and walks away. Mm. Not his job to employ the people. His job is to uh, satisfy shareholders, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the irony is... Perhaps the um, the other one here, which you might also know, uh, never come Monday. No, this is why these conversations are good because I learn stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> well, never come Monday is sort of the other end of it. It's the mm -hmm. concept that um, the workers withdraw and mm. leave the capitalists to wonder what's going on. Now, one of the interesting things about the last uh, few months has been that all the essential services um, that have been cut and maintained and whatever's who's where, the one that's never stopped is bank interest, mm -hmm. which drives rental, which basically is the, um, the lifeblood of the whole damn game at some level or another. Mm -hmm. um, it's all the small businesses are faced with rent costs. Um, Ellen Brown had a really good article the other day about how this was really just turning out to another bank um, bailout. But um, governments are issuing loans all over the place, helicopter money coming from every direction you can think of it. Um, but the banks are still insisting on being repaid. So again, as a government, we're going to um, satisfy the banking industry to make sure that nothing falls off and we keep getting back to business as usual. Sad. Mm. Um, for me, this, this looks like a, um, well, history doing it all again. You know, there, there's never been anything unusual about this sort of a process. It's um, get them up the ladder and then knock out the rungs. You, know, you, you, you create energy to raise the bubble, then the bubble bursts. Right. This is the, the creating a waves because yeah. In, in waves, they have energy, they yeah. have money. Yeah. Unless you get the dead cat bounce. If you, if you go too far, it's right. no good. But uh, basically, um, this seems to be well under control. Business as usual. Drive in the suckers and then shake them off. Okay, so Michael, can I bring, uh, your, can I bring your less cynical uh, part of your, your, yourself into this <clears throat> and ask you what, what um, how might we re- weave some of the, the snipped fabric here in the system. And I know that uh, you're, one, of, one thing is you're a fan of circular money um, and just changing the nature or the aspect of money. But what, uh, what other kinds of responsibilities and connections could be, could be mended here? I think it's beyond mending. I, I well, don't see how you're gonna put this cat back in, in its bag. You know, there's just- Once it has bounced dead. Well, I'm, I'm mixing too many and yeah. at once, but, but basically this is a runaway condition that has run away. Derivatives on derivatives on derivatives on opportunity on corporate quarterly bonuses on, like in Canada, for instance, the bank's um, uh, annual profit is somewhere in excess of a thousand dollars per person in the country. Now I haven't, 
really trace the figures through at all, but if their profit is $1,000 per person in the country, what is their turnover? What is the, um, uh, the figures on this stuff? And it's pretty appalling when you think about it. Now, Michael Hudson's got a, a very good critique of the banking industry as the parasite that persuaded the host that the banking industry is the host and we're lucky to have it. Mm. Um, Michael Hudson out of Kansas somewhere. He's, he's got credentials. Um, <clears throat> he's uh, the son of Carlos Hudson. He's part of the Modern Monetary Theater Theory People Institute for the Study of Long-Term Economic Trends, ILET. Mm -hmm. And here's how, the, how economic theory came to ignore the role of debt, how finance behaves like a parasite toward the economy. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, and, I, here's, I think and here's, the, the, I'm connecting up to parasites, basically. Yeah. Uh, parasitism, parasites numb the host's nervous system. That's one of the ways that they, they take over, basically they control um, their hosts. And I, I guess my perception is that they, this may have gone too far to come back. I think particularly in um, regimes like the United States and with the other little issues that are bubbling up at the moment, um, we may be looking at the big meltdown here. You think, it's, you, you think that's globally gone too far or, or you just said the United States specifically, but you know, is, it, is it a global challenge? Well, it's driven by different issues. I mean, the, the, the Chinese stock market and the Chinese government are in a different world than the Americans. Um, the Russians, yet again, what's happening in, in um, Qatar. You know, every, everybody's looking for a safe place to park their ass. Their ass and, every, and everybody's made sure that there aren't that many safe places. Like it used to be we had blue chip stocks, right? <laughs> they, they were considered the, the, the safe, stolid yeah. stocks. Mm -hmm. There's no more blue chip sector and the companies that used to perform in those industries are no longer reliable and predictable in the way those used to be. So um, there, there's very few safe harbors right now, yeah. if any, I don't know what, I don't know what it is. And, and we've all, we've monetized everything. So we think that money is important to hold in order to retire and not be poor. And then we've made it so that it's really hard to protect, really hard to put someplace and keep. Um, so everybody has a set, there's kind of a collective anxiety about this little dynamic here. That, that keeps us all uh, at yeah. the edge of our seats. Yeah, and it's, um, it's, it's sold as, well, the bank profits are good, but that's all right. They're in all of our pension plans. They're in all of our RSPs. They're in all of our stock portfolios. They're not in mine, baby. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have many of these things to consider, <clears throat> you know? So, the idea that the banks are necessary to keep the numbers crunching so that the prediction of the um, pension market is going to run, that's a bit of a disaster. I think we're mm -hmm. over on that one. Um, and I'm just pointing here in my brain to, I was trying to figure out how did I get to Michael Hudson and all of that. And I think one of the vectors in was, uh, and this is the David Brin article I was just pointing to, but, but here's Nick Hanauer and his, his now multiply given speech, the pitchforks are coming. <clears throat> Basically, hey, wealthy people like me, uh, don't you see that people are really pissed off that this hasn't been working? Like, can't you read the tea leaves? And so there, th this post by David Brin was basically pointing up to, referring to Hanauer and a bunch of others. Brin is a science fiction author who's kind of a conservative, but has interesting radical theories about how things ought to fit together. But, but partly I'm doing a little retrospective, a little uh, forensic research on how did, I get, how did I get to Hudson and his ideas on parasitism. And what, what I love about conversations like this is that first I learned a bunch of new things I hadn't heard of before, which I then later go add to the brain but also it turns over so on stuff I had hit but not noticed. So the articles you just mentioned, uh, you know, here's the ragged, you know, the, the ragged trousered philanthropist uh, book by Trestle. I had seen it obviously at some point in, in the past. And uh, I think I got to it from a World Economic Forum article, Nine Novels That Changed the World. Here's a post that, uh, that somebody wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, you know, the jungle, grapes of wrath, all quiet. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, to Uncle Tom's Cabin. The, all of these, all of these books are actually quite familiar, except this funny one over here, right? 
and and it's, so I it's need a to go back. Book. The, the main book. reason is it's it's a terrible book. book. Oh, it's, good. Yeah, it's 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 another yeah. you know pamphlet attached by the binding. You know, there's about seven little stories, and it, it's it's well structured and it's survived many adaptations and yeah. TV spectaculars and so on. But basically, it's it's polemic, pedantic preaching. Mm. Boring. So it, it's never going to hit the grapes of wrath scale or anything like that. Very interesting. So I wonder how it made the WEF uh, thing because it, it must be saying something important. I, it I, is. I just, it's just, right on the money. He's right got on the it money. down dead and flat. There's it's no just doubt that about it's, it. It's just that his it's, delivery mechanism is polemic. And nothing has changed in the hundred years since he published it. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So here's, I, I just went to Perkins' book, Confessions of Ec Economic Hitman, which I almost always describe as mm. the worst, the worst <laughs> written, most interesting book out there. Like, like dude, dude cannot write. It's a terror. It's, you know, this is as far from Faulkner as you can run in the room. <clears throat> and, and yet it's riveting because, you know, how do we create dead traps? How do we, how do we basically uh, kidnap the resources in countries? We, we get them to sign up for a really big program they actually can't afford. We colonize. First yeah. we come with the guns. Yeah. Then exactly. we come with the germs. <laughs> then we offer a flag, but basically we import the money. Mm. And money is a col colonization device. Well, well this, this is this is what China is doing, of course, yeah. in, the, in the Belt and Road project, is that they're yeah. they're colonizing Southeast Asia and, and Africa and other bits, um, yeah. hmm. which is um, it, that that almost beyond. It. So, so one, I don't know whether this is 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 the right way to take this, but but is something more akin to China's model if China succeeds as America begins to disintegrate if, if, if the worst case is there going to be any learnings from that <laughs> good news bad news yeah. Yeah. good news bad news I mean I don't see a difference we're still oh, operating I'm... on scarcity power exploitation destruction lack of externalities under consideration mm -hmm. you know it's, it's a power trip Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, who, whose power trip are we playing? Whoever's got the whip. Yeah, I think. The, I mean, I think the, 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 the there is a little bit more skin in the game from some of the executives in China because of the government regulation and, and like if you if you do this, not, you, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not suggesting that we should redo really that, but but you know, the, the, well, the, a few people the, the, the taking over all of the assets of of the people who committed fraud. Um, you know, we. we yeah, basically renationalizing the company mm -hmm. um, if, if fraud was committed and, and imprisoning the, the family and, and you know that that's their response to this kind of thing um, which makes you know doing risk management in Hong Kong which is what my wife does quite an interesting job because of the law oh my god <clears throat> here what is the knock-on impact for, for people who've been committed fraud in Hong Kong which is a lot of people um so so you know is 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 that is that if china begins to to push forward and because they're regulating to this this different level is there any of any chance that those parts of the west uh, i mean Amer I, I haven't been to america for years so i i all I hear, all I hear is the the anti-regulation rhetoric that comes out of out of the Republican Party. Um, you know, is that so dominant that you know regulation means lack of growth? Means is there any way to make it make a dent into that rhetoric? Well, Galbraith had a shot at it about fifty years ago. <laughs> that missed. But, yeah. But if, as, if, if the crumble continues, is there a way to make a, a dent in that rhetoric? Yeah, well, I, I live on an island where 3% of our food supply is grown locally, and the other 97 comes on trucks across the ferry. Well, that's 2% more than we grow locally. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. So okay. let me let me just inject a, a note of, of uh, optimism in this conversation, so that we don't all don't all need counseling after the call. <laughs> um, and so I've gone to a, a part of my brain called promising solutions to world crises and thorny social problems. 
And there are many, many, many people making really interesting plays for how we might redesign society, humanity, mm. economic systems, et cetera. <clears throat> and I try to collect them here. So there's, there's one thing called Game B. Uh, Jim Rutt is kind of the hub of Game B. He uh, used to be an entrepreneur with Net Solutions, and he was at the Thompson Corporation and at the source. And he ran this, he, I think he, uh, no, I'm thinking of somebody else, but he was at Santa Fe Institute for a while. Um, and Game B is, an, game A is, is basically the, the present system. Game B is like, where do we go from here? And there's a whole bunch of energy on that right now. A lot of people are doing uh, really interesting work there. And there's some videos here on what is Game B and, and how that works. But there's a, a bunch of people doing these kinds of things. And uh, some of these are subcategories. So the idea of commoning, living in the commons. Uh, David Bollier is, is a huge force there. Uh, there's a really tremendous, you know, transition towns. Uh, there's a, a lot of these have energy and are actually moving in interesting directions. It's just that they haven't collected up their energy and, 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 and linked up. They haven't tipped any of the large institutions or the large institutions we're talking about haven't devastated themselves enough that someone else can pick up and jump in. And I'll add a complicating factor here, which unfortunately comes from the dark side again. <clears throat> People like Steve Bannon and a bunch of others believe in sort of these, these cyclical theories about the fourth turning, for example, uh, which um, basically says that every 80 years or so, here's Steve Bannon, here's the fourth turning by Neil Howe and William Strauss, generational theory, and a bunch of other theories that say that we need to catalyze a disaster so that we can pick up and reorganize society, except I don't think that those of us on this call want to be in the society that Bannon would like to reorganize once everybody's picking up the pieces, right? I think that Bannon's approach to things has little to do with what I've been collecting here under Promising Solutions to World Crises. Um, and so- I, I'm, I'm quite into the, the, so the different interpretations of stage theory. So we're beginning to, there's three different ways of, of perceiving this. Yes, so one please. is the, the, Bannon, the, the one that Bannon is doing is that we go through these four cycles. So it's the, um, the Spengler stuff, the, yes. the, 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 the rise and fall of the, of the Roman Empire. It's the, we go through these four stages of, uh, and the last stage is sort of decay. And, and, and so, so you birth, you rise, you peak, and you decay and decline and death. And then it, out of it comes uh, a reimagined um, society. And I think, I mean, Bannon is almost Kierkegaardian in his attempt to recreate Christianity, sort of an old school Christianity on, on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and Freud, uh, sorry, um, Nietzsche talked about, you know, he was trying to recreate the sort of the, the Greek, um, the joyous Greek society pre-Christ. Pre and, and <laughs> so, so, but but a, lot of, a, lot of a lot of people who, who, who look at this uh, as sort of a, a Nietzschean in, in, in their direction. So that's one, that's one. Um, the second is that periods so of the Hegelian model is that there's actually no cycles that we, we just get more and more turbulence as we create a more and more perfect society. So before you get to your perf perfection, you, you have all of these turbulent challenges that you have to get past, but mm -hmm. we're, we're on an up, upward path. Now, my favorite theory is the sort of the, the stuff that came out of the UK over the last 20 years. So Zygmunt Bauman and um, uh, Giddens. And they talk about having to come to terms with just increasing fragmentation and liquidity of life. That, that all we're going to get is a disintegration of certainty and, and more and more ambivalence and fragmentation and different perceptions and different interpretations. And we have to learn to live with it. And we have to design institutions that can help us learn to live with this um, rather than... Uh, train us to expect certainty and, and deliver certainty. So I, I think that's the way the world is. We are, we are gonna go into a fragmenting, liquefying society, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just, that's the direction. But a lot of people like Bannon find that extremely uh, anxiety provoking. Yeah. And they would prefer to tear down a world like that to create a new form of order. Uh, and in Bannon's time, it's the Judeo-Christian kind of rebirth of America with, with, with its Judeo-Christian roots. It's the flip side of Sharia law, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> it's it's yeah. The, the Christian version of thereof. Yeah, so I, th I, I, I think one of the big challenges is to, 
to sort of say, and, and this really, and, and one of the big, one of the issues I have is a lot of the postmodernists try and do the, the the multiple interpretation stuff, and they do it so badly. They've gone into fragmented identity rather into rather than into the sort of fluidity of of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that sort of divide that that sort of defines where we are at the moment. You've got one group wanting to tear down um, different ways of interpreting the world, and another group trying to create different ways of interpreting, and they don't have to talk to each other. Um, now, where the economy and the banks sit in all of that, I'm not 100 percent sure. I think they're uh, I think they're jammed in the middle of that whole thing because that's a, that's one of the major arenas where this battle plays out. And those are the people who control, who gets resources over time, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, then the other, another one is politics, political battles, and the rise of the alt-right around the world mm-hmm. uh, is another one of the Titanic arenas. And these things probably have su- substantial overlaps I don't know about. But one of the, this is one of the fascinations I have right now. So this is one of my favorite thoughts right now, again, to the dark side, but we're in a Titanic battle over the narratives in our heads and by the way, we, by the way, we've always been. This is just a characteristic of society. And if you if you read uh, Yuval Noah Harari, he's like, you know, our ability to create collective fictions is what distinguishes humans from lots of other critters. Hmm. And I'm carrying that idea of collective fictions into collective fictions are how we control society. Once you get more than twelve people in a tent, uh, you need to figure out how to manage a whole bunch of people. And the easiest way to do that is to convince them all of some script, some narrative, some belief system. Uh, and if you can, if you can sort of toe the line on that and uh, be consistent, that works pretty well. And, you know, uh, ancient Egypt does this for 2000 years, not because they don't know how to draw perspective and, and naturalistic renderings, but because this is what religion says sacred art looks like. I thought that was Egyptian. It, it was walk like an Egyptian, but yeah, still, yeah. That, yeah. that was a later, that was a later remix of said culture. Yeah. I caught a, um, a broadcast by Dave Snowden the other day. I put the Facebook link up there. It's about an hour of Snowden just ripping it off. I don't know if you, you know Dave Snowden stuff. I've met him a couple times. He's brilliant. Whenever he speaks, I take notes and I like fill my, pe- my sheet of paper immediately. He's, he, I've never heard him quite so dense as he, he is in this presentation. He doesn't, doesn't bother sort of elaborating much. He just lays it down and moves on to the next one. I was I was on a Zoom call with him on Wednesday and he was very dense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's right in there. <laughs> and one of the things he was he was mentioning was uh, memes are out, tropes and narratives. Mm. Connected narratives. Really? Um, he thinks memes yeah, are he, out? He, memes are passe, sir. Don't, you've got to stay with it. Come on, memes are over. I don't know. uh, Well, nobody does. But he's making the point that if you're going to change things rather than just disrupt them, it has to include some degree of coherence. Right. Therefore, narratives and tropes rather than bang, bang memes. Now, he also makes the point that our danger is um, what I think he called retrospective coherence. Uh That we go back to business as much as possible as we can. Where if there's any indication here, it is that business as usual is the problem. Right. Mm. So um, we have the danger of people grabbing for um, just like it used to be. And that's not where we really need to be. So retrospective coherence in the way you understood it from him was, gosh, if only we could go back to the good old days. It's like our desire to make a coherent view of the world by by going back to that world. Or no? Um, Am I misunderstanding you? Short term back, and I think he's tech, talking about going back three months, not three years, not 30 years. He's oh, really? talking about the danger of people just sort of back to exactly the same procedures and drivers and activities that have given us the just-in-time supply chain, all the fragility. But we, right. once this Humpty has dumped, and it has... Once Humpty has dumped, it, why, why have I never heard that said before? Go ahead. I don't know. You just weren't in luck. Anyway, th- this one is not going back on the wall. You can't put these pieces to be Oh, look, the plane crashed. Pick it up yeah. and throw it. It's not going to work. Now, all sorts of consequences are going to come out of this. Nobody has any idea what they are, unless they're 
very lucky well, in the casino. So uh, one of my, two, two thoughts. One is that I'm collecting up what large scale social changes will the COVID pandemic drive? So what, you know, there, and there's plenty of talk about this, but, but from what you just said, one of my takes on history is that for every large historic event, there were, there were a bunch of people who were right beforehand, a whole bunch. It's just that nobody was listening to them. What they were saying was so unpalatable, so taboo, so outrageous, so unexpected that nobody could hear it, whatever it is. A few of those people were just lucky because they were just like throwing spaghetti on the wall. But a few of those people had a coherent view of what was up and could describe it and understand it. So, so after Trump won, I, I, I basically collected up my, the best I could find. Um, uh, where did I put it? I, I've collected up the best articles about Trump's win that I could that I that I could find, uh, which are these right here. And so Jonathan Haidt talking about stuff. Uh, Scott Adams Dilbert uh, actually did some really good analysis of of Trump. Uh, Adam Curtis in the documentary Hypernormalization talks about tr Trump figures six times in Hypernormalization, published in 2016. Uh, you know, be before he wins the way before he wins the election and all that. Uh, so I also have a thought, uh, people and systems who predicted a Trump victory. And here's Scott Adams, Richard Rorty, Mark Blythe, uh, Michael Moore, who does this article, uh, five, where is it? <clears throat> five reasons why Trump will win. <clears throat> Here it is. Um, five reasons why Trump will win. Excellent and accurate. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so I say all of that because um, Right now, somebody is out there writing very reasonable pieces for what's going to stick and what's not. So bringing us back to where we were on the, in, the, in the conversation. And I think trying to figure out reasoning systems, you know, or some, some kind of logics or ladderings or scaffolding for why is, is really important and, and, and can help us figure out what, which of the many promising solutions to this situation to back, for example, or where to apply a lever <clears throat> or some glue to the situation so that, um, they, so that things cohere better and, and so that one side tips and gets more energy, more momentum, more, more whatever than the other. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, but at, at this point, <clears throat> what we're looking at is the fake news, the, the post-truth, they make it up as you go along, the right to believe what you like and so I... the, the collective unintelligence. Yes. It's, uh, I mean, we, we like talk about, <clears throat> yeah, just the, the things that we all don't want to talk about because they're so edgy and problematic. So they just drift under the surface and become the norm. Right. That basically runs us whether we know it or not. And uh, the collective unintelligence at this point is run for, the, for cover. No point in sticking your head up. You're going to get knocked off. Um, Which historically is a good strategy. <clears throat> you know, yeah. gotta say, a lot of the survivors are the ones who reacted that way for various bad events in the world in world history. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right; you're totally like. <clears throat> and and for me, fake news is basically a, an extremely intentional undermining of trust. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that there that that <clears throat> a bunch of people who studied sociology, psychology, mass psychology, a whole bunch of interesting realms have discovered that if you can strike fear in people's hearts and undermine their faith in science, facts, journalism, whatever, uh, you can then run the table for a while. And, and I think, I mean, historically, you don't get to run the table for that long and things end badly, but people don't seem to mind that. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, a few times that you get to run the table for a couple centuries, that's awful good. Um, and I think that's maybe the bet that, that they're making. But, uh, but this is, I, I think this is very intentional. So maybe cynicism uh, is the solution, that you <clears> just <throat> stop believing anything you hear. And so therefore, you, get, you don't get the anxiety. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that, that's an well, it's, potential it's, it's, I think, I, think um, I, I, I try to cultivate a kind of realistic optimism in myself. And, and by realistic, I mean all the stuff I'm describing about what's going down and, and, you know, fake news and the things Michael's bringing up. And I've got a few things I need to research and add to my brain afterward that I hadn't heard of, <clears throat> but, but I want to be clear eyed about what's going down right now and not ignore a bunch of things because they're too hard to contemplate or 
they just don't make sense from my old yeah, lens, with my old lens. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. I, I mean, I think that's that sort of more modern interpretation of cynicism that I was going for. Um, oh, good. So the, the, the alignment with apathy. So I was going for the Slosser Dyke's critique of cynical reason. So when he divides between kinicism and cynicism, um, and I'm always on the, kin the, the kinical side where, where there's actually action involved, that you, you, you see the shit underlying um, what's going on, but that doesn't depress you or make you apathetic. It, it's, it's, it's almost a perspective that out of it comes, comes action or something. It moves me into irony rather than, than I think he failed in, his criti in, 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 in the end of his critique. So who but is it, this? It's, Can you name him? Peter Slosserdijk. I don't know. So, I... uh, S L O T E R D Y K, I think. I will let uh, Google. I think, it's, I think it's only one T, <clears throat> yeah. Critique of Cynical Reason. Uh, S O, uh, one T, you're right. Uh, Peter Slaughter back to Paul University. Uh, On the book. Well, I'll hire it's, him. It's, that's uh, funny. No, that's maybe a different Peter Slaughter. Probably a different Slaughter <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And the book, the book is, is called Critique of Cynical Reason. Um, there we go. <clears throat> cool. Well, that's 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 arguably the, the great sort of modern critique of um, uh, of of, the, of what's going on with cynicism. I mean, he's been sort of replaced a little bit by Zizek in in that direction. Okay, this is really weird. You're seeing what I just did, right? <clears throat> <laughs> so we figured out how to spell them correctly. I went and looked it up again, and uh, I I at some point have run across obviously Peter Slaughter. Mm. But, but I will note, I didn't absorb him, meaning... Oh, it's a, yes, I'm not surprised. It's a bastard of a book to read. It took well, me about three, three attempts to understand what he was going on about. And, <laughs> and I, don't, I don't buy all the books that are in my brain. I don't, don't try to digest them all. But I'm <clears> always happy when I find a really, really excellent analysis, in particular a comparative analysis, between various people's thinking. And so I had you know, uh, the book in here, Critique der Zynischen Vernunft. Um, but I had no idea what role it plays in, in thinking about the world. So thank you for that. And can, yeah. you just, can you just talk about this for a little bit more? Yeah, well, he's basically arguing that, that we all have called to the game. So we sort of know to certain levels that, that the, the good and the powerful are, are, are being cynical in their, their supposed ethical intentions. Um, and so that everyone is cynical uh, to some extent because they've, they've called the game and they don't believe the pronouncements of the powerful. Um, and he, he just, he, he, he sort of historicizes that. He, he goes back into history and, and shows all the examples of it. And then he argues that, that that's led us towards apathy. And actually the, the, there's an active form of cynicism if you go back to the, the ancient Greeks uh, that we've forgotten. And, and, mm. and that was, that was a, almost a performance art um, mm. that, that you, you tried to reveal the shit uh, in, in the midst of the tinsel. Um, and, and sort of say, well, you know, they're, they're, however smart and fancy you think you're being, there's all of this going on underneath, and, and maybe we should <clears throat> try and take a bit more of a middle ground and try and do something about it rather than right. just ignore its existence or wallow in it, which are the, the, the two other op options. Um, now, that sort of takes me into a, to, to back to what Dave Snowden's trying to do. Yeah. Because yeah, Dave's incredibly cynical. I mean, he's one of the most yes. cynical people I've ever met. Um, and he's trying, and, and it's quite interesting. So I, I had this discussion with him about tropes and narratives, I'll say, since last Wednesday. So he's moving away from um, Deleuzean theory when he talks about, um, what is it, the, what is it called, tropes? Deleuze has a different word for tropes, I remember, as appendages. Uh, I mean, he's going back into classical rhetoric when he goes into tropes and, and narratives. Um, and that's what the right is doing. The right uses tropes and the right uses rhetoric and the left mm -hmm. uses science and rhetoric beats science. Every so time. Dave, Dave is trying to go back into rhetoric to, to compete, but he, ta he talks, as Michael said, in this dense scientific language. Yes. So he spent masses of time talking about sort of this quantum entanglements and using that in social science. And you're sort of going, well, I sort of follow Dave, but I haven't oh. read quantum <clears throat> physics. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so, so we had a little discussion. I said, look, you've got to understand how tropes work before you can start doing this. 
and I talked about Cynic Decker, which is is so tropes has had there's there are four sort of master tropes uh, in in the work of the the so Kenneth Burke is the guy who sort of first wrote about this, um, and he talks about the four master tropes, which are metaphor, metonymy, Cynic Decker, and irony. Um, and you break when when someone believe something it's when they start speaking in cynic decker so which the metaphor gets broken down into metonymy so that's the sub parts of a metaphor uh -huh. and as you move back up to the concept of the metaphor so you start using the sub parts to within your speech and that illustrates what your belief system is so it's a, it's a movement instead of a movement down where you're trying to break a metaphor down into its component parts to to, to make sense of it it's a movement right. back up where meaning when you you start using the component parts and it exp that, you, that that constructs your worldview so his argument is that that he hears it everywhere and that's the process of getting someone to believe in a new in a new model of thinking is to get is to break it down and turn it into something that everybody starts using so if you then go into lakoff's work that's what he argues with the the was it the, the george lakoff yeah, the um, I think you know, don't you, Jerry? Yeah, yeah. yeah he, uh, so, he was a neighbor in Berkeley, and I've met him at a couple events. So he talked. Yeah. What, what does he talk about? The the nurturing uh, meta mother, metaphors we live by. Uh, the stern father and the nurturing mother, or the, exactly or something like that. Mor moral so politics. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, moral so, politics. So he talks <clears throat> about sort of that paternalistic metaphor. Yeah, you the, nurture, sort of the nurturing the, parent and the strict father. The strict father. Yeah. So you can see by the language people use, which belief system that they, they're embedded in and they believe yeah. in fiction, the fiction that they will defend with their lives. So the argument that, uh, I think the argument, and partially you made to me in one of our previous conversations, is the right is incredibly good at this. Yes. The left is incredibly bad at this. Yes. The left and, only has Lakoff, kind of, and the right has a whole army of people working on it. Yeah. And Dave <clears> is <throat> trying to do it is not using language that, I mean, it's using language that even the brightest of the bright struggle to follow. That's really so, interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. so how do you change that? Wow. What he's trying to do into a, into a sort of a holding metaphor that works. Yeah. So, so one of my beliefs is that the postmodernists were largely right. Uh, they were correct in their critiques, but two problems. They were too early. The, the, the tidal wave had not crested over them. The consumerism had to play out a lot longer <clears throat> than where they were in time. But also they ended up speaking only to themselves in a jargon that mm. was impossible to penetrate from the outside. So, so they, they made themselves useless <coughs> right, by basically creating an, sort of an internecine discipline that, that nobody else could penetrate. So it sounds like, it sounds like that might be a, a habit, custom, practice, or result of thinking very deeply well, about something that matters where your language gets refined. This is what happens in PhD programs. Your language gets refined so, that, it, so yeah. that every <laughs> word is freighted. And what you think this word means is not what the general public thinks this word means. Those are two, mm. there's, there's, like, there's like this gap between the specialized term and the public perception of the term. And so mm. I, think, I think what you're saying is, if you can take an everyman's approach toward language, tropes, ideas and just drop them in one at a time so that they're easily accessible, absorbable and, mm. and forwardable and likable and, you know, retweetable. You can then take over the conversation through yes, synecdoche, yeah. I guess, which is a word I've never paid attention to and now, and now must. Um, and, and therefore you can change uh, the narrative that rule that dominates us in the way that I was talking about earlier. Mm. And it just took us to another thought in my brain, which is a, another really important one. Emotion and membership trump reason most mm. of the time. Stories are the vessel. Absolutely, so, yes. So I, I could create, and, and this is one of my misgivings with using the brain and trying to work into an environment where we might do more of conversations like this with a little bit of context, which is, this is not emotional or I can tell stories around the brain, which is interesting. That's kind of this interesting middle ground, but this is my attempt to marshal facts, arguments, definitions, relationships, references, context. And that's all reason, right? And so somebody who can, who can instead appeal well to emotions and create a, a really slapdash fabulous narrative is going to wash right over mm. attempts to, to attempts to do <clears throat> the logic of the matter. And so I'm trying to figure out <clears throat> how do, for me personally, how do I tell better stories? How do I, how do I connect through emotions instead of through 
you know, these, uh, these other vessels? Uh, and how does that all work? Well, you're going to struggle because you're a heart of scientist and scientists, scientists find rhetoric a dirty word. Yes. Um, because they, they think the best argument should win. Um, exactly. Which, which, was, is, which is what science tries to do itself yeah. internally. Yeah, absolutely. But that's not how you win the hearts and minds of the public. Correct. You, you do something else. Um. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> exactly. How do you do it? So, so the question here, how do, you, how do you end up having a richer, a richer vocabulary, or even in, in Trump's terms, a dumber vocabulary, but it attracts more people? Well, how, how do you do that? Scott Adams' um, analyses of Trump from the seduction community perspective were absolute genius. <clears throat> so here's, here's Scott Adams on Trump. Here's Scott Adams, he's the, the guy who writes Dilbert. Uh, here's Dilbert, which is an industry of its own, came out in 1989. <clears throat> but he, he is a kind of a contrarian, I'd say. And he came out with a whole bunch of really nice posts, which I went through, like clown genius, Trump the closer, Trump makes Univision do the perp walk. Trump and birtherism, et cetera. These are all his analyses of, of Trump at work. And this is why when I did my videos on Trump, I was like, Trump is far more on the ball and far more dangerous than we think he is. <clears throat> not, that, not that Trump understands Deleuze and has figured out the mechanisms in our brains or the neurochemistry and the dopamine and the, none of that, not, not a piece of that. He's probably never picked up a book on any of this stuff and doesn't care but he has an understanding, a deep understanding built from Roy Cohn and his father and a bunch of others of how humans individually and collectively work from this fear perspective and this manipulation perspective. And these things, he's a black belt in, a complete black belt, right? And so what's interesting, one of the silver linings of the Trump era is that there are now on the table a whole bunch of topics that were sort of taboo and were just off the table a long time ago. We can now talk about all this stuff. Right? It, it, it's up, it's out, it's, it's bubbled forth. And a lot of the people, a lot of the latent, uh, latent racism that was buried in the country is now boiling over in the streets. And the racists have come out and said, here I am, right? That's interesting, um, but what to do about it, right? And how to combat extremely intelligent narrative overthrow. Yeah, uh, it's intelligence narrative couched in, in, in dumb words. Uh, that's even more powerful. <laughs> and that's what, that's what took me to Scott Adams analyzing Trump. Yeah. He, said, he said, watch this clip. And in this, trip, in this clip, Trump would say the same thing over and over again. He, he basically, he sounded like a babbling idiot, except, except at the end of it, you're like, oh crap. And, and one of the points I make in, in the videos on, I did on Trump is my, my buddy Al basically said, um, you know, right after the election, right after Trump wins the election. So what's, what was Hillary going to do had she won? And I couldn't come up with anything. And what's Trump going to do on, on, on Inauguration Day? And Trump had trained me in his program. I could enumerate his program. And that was really frightening to me. Like I felt a chill run through my body when I realized that I'd been trained to do this through the methods I'm trying to collect up and understand here. Just two things. Well, I mean, I had a bit of an argument with Mark Ritson, the sort of a marketing professor out of Melbourne, um, where he uh, he was arguing that the digital technology in Facebook, etc., was the, sort of the cause of Trump's win. And I said, no, he, he's um, he's a master showman, and it's 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 the word of mouth that yep. the companies, the TV performances, and 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 the the stadia um, events, etc. Um, it's all coordinated to be a great rhetorical show. Yes, and, um, and, and it works. And it works, and it's always worked. It's worked for two and a half thousand years, so why is it going to stop working now all of a sudden? Um, well, yeah. Judy, <laughs> welcome to the call. I, we're way down the rabbit hole here. Um, it looks like there. Nice to see you. Uh, and you're muted right now, so if you want to jump in. Um, We've, we've gone from uh, SNP and the financial crisis way down the rabbit hole into uh, cynical, what was it, Re realism? Cynical, no. cynical, uh, the critique of cynical reason, yeah. The critique and, of and cynical reason and Trumpism mm. and, and uh, how emotion trumps logic and a whole bunch of other things. Sorry, I just saw the note now. I hadn't, didn't have it on my calendar originally. Um, so 
for, for whatever reason. I don't remember whether we got a note out or it just sort of happened. <laughs> no worries. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah. So we're trying to figure all this stuff out. So Richard, yeah, how, how, how do you, how do you make clever dumb? That's, that's the key. I think. Well, or, or there's a whole different piece of this, which is just, just speaking from the heart and being very present, which also creates those kinds of connections. Yeah, you've got the sort of idea, you've got the, the, the paradox of authenticity then, haven't you, which is very yes. interesting. That, that the, the public have so, so disbelieved in any politician being authentic, that even, even a horrific authenticity like Trump has right. is attractive. <laughs> <laughs> because yes. you, you, you think, well, he, because this, this is the clip critique of cynical reason. I've called the game. All politicians are, are game, the game players. Well, Trump doesn't seem to be. Yeah, he's horrific, but at least he's saying, I think, I believe that what he's, in what he's saying, and I believe he's going to do what he says he's going to do. So and, I'll vote for him. And horrifying though, it is. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. So what did you say? I said horrifying though it is. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, and let me just add that um, <clears throat> there's a book, Air Guitar, Essays on Art and Democracy by Dave Hickey, who was a Rolling Stone writer, basically a music critic. And he's and in this book, the first chapter is a pay-in to Las Vegas. And he says, Las Vegas is the only authentic American city. Because <laughs> what you see is what you get. Like it, the, the, the cracks are right there. Everybody knows that it's, that it, there's like a veneer over every, like, and it's, it's a really interesting riff. And so, I added to my brain, Trump is authentic like Vegas is authentic, right? And uh, that's under, why do people support Trump? And I've got a bunch of reasons, right? Including Trump uh, has been a gold mine for conservatives. He's paid off. Like if you put, if you put your chips on the Trump, on the Trump number, on the, on the craps table, um, it's, it's paid off really well so far. And, I'll, and I'm back to my cynicism here. And unfortunately, if you wanted the system broken in order that some new system may rise from the ashes, uh, we are on that glide path right this second. We're on final approach, arguably. How, but then you get, I think that's where the hope might lie. I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear Michael on Banks again. Um, but uh, I'd, the hope is that you know, once you break the system, the generation that's coming up doesn't believe in the system that, um, Bannon particularly wants to rebuild, for example. You know, you're actually going to get a whole bunch of people building it who are not the kind of people you you expected to build it because you well, don't have any control of, of of that bit. When it was reborn, you don't have the planning control. It's it's yeah. it's organic. Um, so that, that so there might be hope there that that a whole bunch of people start trying to build a different system, and if the banks don't get in the way. <laughs> Well, the banks are the way. Basically, the banks have been running this show for so long. And uh, it's, it's the Hudson line, you know. They are the parasites that took over. Um, when, when I was at business school, and it was a long, long time ago, 1970, um, on exit, I was generally regarded by the business policy guy as the man most likely to rob a bank. <laughs> and I've been working on that ever since because it's really a wonderful prospect. Um, we, the banks deal in linear money, the straight through stuff. Mm -hmm. The banks could do circular money in a flash. There'd be no time at all for them to implement closed loop currencies. Van City, for instance, Vancouver's credit union has um, half a million account holders, staff of 150. They're a big, big operation. They're basically a bank that says- They're very cool. Yeah, they're, they're the good money boys. They could uh, offer, for instance, time banks all across Vancouver in a matter of minutes. You know, in most credit union software now, you can create a separate savings account for your dog, a separate savings account for your car insurance or whatever. Um, and you just do it on the fly. You designate another account. Now, if a set of accounts were designated as non-transferable, i.e. I can't take value out of this account and put it in there because this one is in US dollars, this one is in Canadian dollars, this one is in ours. 
you obviously can't translate hours into dollars. So you have a closed loop of hours to hours accounts amongst say all the people in this subdivision, all the people in this sector of the city as an option. Now it's no cost to the banks to do that. There's no impediment. Back in, in 82, when we started the let system, the, the first opp opportunity I had was to talk to my local credit union. They, they said, yes, yeah, great idea. We'd love to do this, but we don't run the software. Go down to Vancouver. So I went through the BC Central Credit Union organization. They agreed it was a useful prospect. We took it to the mainframe on the south of town, and they said, well, uh, you're one credit union amongst the 60 that we serve. Therefore, there's no budget allocation for this, so, so forget it. But that was the only reason for not doing yeah. it, was so that it was inconvenient. A really, a, a brief interjection, because I learned a bunch about credit unions. I talked to the, the guy who's running the internet credit union, the, the short-lived internet credit union that the, the Internet Archive started. And he said, it's really easy to start a credit union. And by the way, the software is right there at hand. You approach a CUSO, a credit union service organization, and you basically lease their software and you, you know, use their platform. All of that is great and easy. The problem comes if you want anything different mm -hmm. because the, these, this software is certified to go, it's okay for banking as it is, almost no changes are accepted. So, so basically credit unions are awesome. I wish there were more and they are frozen in time because innovation is almost impossible in the sector until somebody fixes this problem. <clears throat> so, so we should have people's banks, we should, you know, public banks, we should have a whole bunch of things, but those avenues have been really like reliably closed in so many ways. That's crazy, but, but it is. Well, as applied to hard assets, you know, the usual financial security stuff. Yes. Uh, well plugged, considerable limits and enforced in the software and uh, all the expectations, but there's really no reason why um, a credit union couldn't uh, simply offer its account holders a gateway out through their identity as defined by the credit union. That's the authentication. Yep. Uh, press this button if you are interested. And that takes you into the shadow zone of um, self-defined circular monies. Exactly. Um, at your own risk. And here's, no. here's my collection of alternative currencies, which include, includes Cash Clash. Yeah, you did. that and yeah, yeah. Uh, all that stuff. So the issue is not whether it's possible. The issue for me is why is it not being done? Right. And what can be done to drive it? And I, I, was, um, I was actually on my way to Korea in February. It got called off the day before I flew at the end of January for various reasons that you can understand. Hmm. And the, the, the event was um, universal basic income, a conversation about um, what's going on in Europe. The Brits were there, the Europeans, the Americans, the Canadians. Um, the reason that Japan, uh, Korea is interested in this is that basically if they do go basic income, it's about 600 billion a year, which is a drop in the bucket. I mean, let's be clear about it. We're just talking about the accounting, but You've got to get that through the politics. Right. And 600 billion looks like a really big number. So is there a cheaper way of approaching this? That was the proposition I was going to take to Korea. For Korean ears, spoken with a Scottish, English, Canadian accent, it wasn't a high probability of getting anywhere. But fortunately, they canceled. <clears throat> <laughs> now, not going to a place gives me a lot more latitude on what would have happened if I'd been. Exactly. And You're not only didn't I go to Korea, I didn't go to Germany. I didn't yeah. go to Iceland. I didn't go to Brazil. There's all sorts of places on the planet I didn't go to. Who have exactly the same problem. How are they going to introduce something that saves their ass? Right. The, the Korean problem is that they train everybody militarily. You know, everybody knows how to carry a gun and mm -hmm. plant an explosive. They don't know how to find a job. Right. Parasite mm -hmm. was um, a powerful piece of... Have you seen Parasite? I have not watched it. Wow. It's Macbeth in, in, in Eastern clothes. It's, cool. It's, it's, it's really a profound piece of work. It's the, the most interesting thing I've seen 
in that genre for an awful long time. Okay, it just bumped up our cue. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, and it ties into Hudson's problem. Um, you know, like how do you get out from the parasite? Yeah. Well, let me. Um, Sorry, are you done? Are you through? Well, with uh, not quite. It, it, the, Go ahead. the issue is that the, the, there's another aspect in this. There's a, a guy called Tim Jenkin, who's a big man in the old currency movement. He was a South African who was imprisoned for eight years for printing pamphlets in 1978 in um, Pretoria High um, Security Jail. Tim Jenkin. You can find J him on Wikipedia. Yeah. J I N K J E N K I N. He got out of the prison through 12 doors by constructing wooden keys and um, a lot of other things. It's a fascinating story. You can see huh. it on Wikipedia. There's a, he wrote a book, which is brilliant. They made a 40-minute video, which is a National Geographic uh, product, and it's brilliant. And last month, um, Harry Potter came out uh, with a, uh, Daniel Radcliffe played Jenkin in a, a, a remake. The, the remake lo really looks pretty crappy, to tell you the truth. Um, uh -huh. <clears throat> what do you expect? But the point I'm, I'm making about this is that Jenkin found his way out of the prison through the walls. His statement in his book is that he felt himself to be outside the prison morally, emotionally, so many ways, just his physical frame was inside the walls. And hmm. he had to go out through the walls because he couldn't go up. There was no way up. But on the other hand, dealing with a banking system, I think there's a very clear way up. Just let's float ourselves above this crap mm -hmm. and gain um, values in the economy out of the way that we run it, rather than trying to compensate for the crap we've been uh, left with. Mm -hmm. So, so I, that's my trajectory on that is don't try and go through the walls of the banking system. Don't try and beat the regulatory process. Don't try and get right. moral behavior in uh, executives who are paid on bonuses. Um, change the game. Play a different game. And, so, and a, a couple thoughts. Um, one is that this moment of lockdown has, has changed so many behaviors quite radically uh, that it, it makes people look around for alternatives. Like people are like, mm -hmm. crap, you know, well, the kids are home and we like, <laughs> we're trying to do what the school said to do and that's not working so well. Uh, it's making everybody unhappy. So how do we actually, uh, how do we actually fix this from here? Uh, how do we actually fix this from here and, and you know, do something productive? Um, there we go. And, um, and so I'm losing my train of thought, sorry. There we go. Um, and partly, uh, the second thought I wanted to, to throw in was back to, um, back to how, how, how some things don't turn out the way some planners want. And, and this is back to what Richard was saying a little, a little while ago. Um, one of my beliefs, uh, and this comes from reading books like The Red and the Blue uh, and a, a bunch of other things, was that Newt Gingrich basically brought us the current era of political divisiveness that when he wins the, the midterm election was made Speaker of the House, um, he instantiates a new set of rules for everybody where nobody from the right should talk to anybody on the left. Uh, Congress people used to room together, eat together, exercise together, uh, socialize together. All of that was off the table, et cetera. And, and so there's a scorched earth strategy basically pursued for 30 years, which Trump inherits. And I'm reasonably sure that Newt Gingrich thought he was gonna be king, but the last person he really wanted to own the kingdom was this guy, Donald Trump, who had had his eyes on the kingdom for 40 years, right? And, and Trump is a fabulous opportunist and, and saw that the ground had been laid that was actually perfect, perfect for Trump. And one of the things I say in the videos is that the path that Trump took to win was possibly the only path he might've taken. Not that he saw all the twists and turns, but that insulting absolutely everybody and being outrageous and being a clown and all those things were actually quite intentional because for example a guy like donald trump would never survive an actual debate with ted cruz who is a you know yale debate winning champion and hillary clinton who can hold her own with facts and all that kind of stuff so 
So he had to make sure that none of the debates were actually a debate, <clears throat> that all of the debates were a show, a display of modern power. And in modern power, owning the media cycle is what wins. So all of that to say that the way that the current the way our current political dynamics on the ground got there was a lot of patient work by a lot of people whose work was then co-opted, right? Um, and so the people in charge now aren't necessarily people who, who thought it up and, and did a lot of the groundwork. And I'm, I'm just really interested in how do we make our way back into um, something more fruitful, more productive. And we have a, just a couple of minutes left in our in our 90 minutes here, but <clears throat> any, if, if any of you want to put in some, some maybe uh, optimistic uh, or mis misplaced optimism in the, at the end of the conversation here. I mean, is, is it the, the, <clears throat> the last breath of a, of a dying generation though? Um, which is both pessimistic and optimistic simultaneously. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree. Um, you know, look, I've forgotten the guy's name, but he wrote the S curve. Um, and he sort of, he, that's his argument. Uh, Michael, uh, sorry, no, uh, Dick Foster. Uh, different, different book. Oh, okay. <laughs> different version. Different, different S curve. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then he, he's made this argument that we're, we're seeing that, that this current culture we're seeing is the dying breath of a, of a, of a group of traditionalists who can't see the way, the, the way that the world is going to change because of the techno technological leaps that we're, that, that are being made. Um, that that's I think it's a very plausible argument. I just can't remember his name. I normally let hold on. Like let, me, let me let me share. Uh, you're really good at this. So uh, let me see if any of these S curves is it jumping the S curve? Nunes and Green. No, no. Uh, uh, it's probably not the called he calls it the S curve. The book might not be called the S curve. Yeah, <laughs> which, is, which would is be it Adesis. No, no. Uh, is it profiting from technological change? No. Nope. Uh, let's let's Google it and find it. So I'll find it. Um, yeah. But and, that, it's not, and it's not diffusion. It's certainly not diffusion of innovations. The Everett Rogers stuff. No, but it, it's it's. Uh, I can't remember the name of his book. It's not the S curve. But he talked about the S curve in it. And what he, was the? Sorry, can you say again what he was saying in the book? So he, he basically argues that we're experiencing success curves. So we're 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 seeing this exponential growth. Um, he, he talks, I think he talks about 40 odd, but there's six core ones. And one mm. of them is he's arguing this countercultural movement by traditionalists who, who find, again, it sort of goes back to the argument I was making about fragmentation. They find it, they, they find they're so provoked into anxiety by the current fragmented state of the world is that they are willing, in order to get order, they are willing to embrace the devil. Right. Um, and, and the count, and that's the, he said, this is the last breath of this, of this, this, they, they, they've been prodded into action by stuff that was going on and, and they, they voted in these sort of authoritarians promising them a stable world, but they're not going to, um, it, it's not going to last. Something else is going to happen afterwards, which is his argument, which is a very clear argument he makes, if I could remember his name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, it'll it'll come to you, and I, I'm looking forward to mm. to looking at that. Um, Michael, any any thoughts from from what we've turned over here the last ninety minutes? Langdon Morris, that's his name. Oh, Landon or Langdon? Langdon. But the book is probably not called the S curve. Uh, I've got one of his book, Agile Innovation, The Revolutionary Approach to Accelerate Success, but that's probably not the book. No, that's not it, but it's, it's, it's whatever his... He's a futurist, right? Yeah, he's a futurist, but it was a really... I, I presented at the same conference with him, he keynoted. Yeah. And that's the bit that stuck in my mind, that, that, the, um, that there, were, there was some kind of flattening out of this, of all of these exponential changes, which is standard. And we're going to see it happen with this. So foresight, he wrote foresight and extreme creativity strategy for the 21st century, agile innovation, managing the evolving corporation, fourth generation R and D, soulful branding. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't sound like any of these. Oh, it doesn't, does it? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's the big shift. Not... The big shift. It's the big shift. Oh. 83 most important changes. <laughs> 83. I love it.
but he, he he reduces it to six in his keynote, so it, it feels a bit like Tom Peters to me when he, he had to do the same thing with the uh, in search of excellence stuff. Here's all these ideas, but actually our brains are only big enough to understand six, so I talk about six. Mm -hmm. But it's it's because it basically has all eight, I think all eighty three of them rest curves, and then he he um, he sort of explains what's going on in these various different dimensions. It's really interesting. I'm not sure whether he's right. Yeah, um, but I hope he is because it does. It is quite a hopeful world that he's talking about exiting into. Well, I think that's probably the core. Um, what's that book been down so long? It looks like up to me. Mm -hmm. mm. Remember that one? Mm, unfortunately, yeah. I didn't read it. Oh, it, it's it's powerful. I mean, it doesn't speak any answers, but it points out the uh, dilemma. Um, and I, I guess that's it. There's no other direction but up in the sense of the transitions that we're looking at. I, I, I'm seeing it as a shift from um, a sequential sort of tree planting attitude, like build things sequentially, logically, to um, the mycelium uh, fruits. There's a, an outburst of sort of information driven responses mm -hmm. um, all over the world without without planning or pattern in in sense of um, it's predictable mm -hmm. it's an it's emergent it's um, mm -hmm. it's the caterpillar butterfly thing well this and is where Snowden is really useful too yeah I think so because um, this whole sense respond you know probe sense respond thing etc is mm -hmm. like right on this adjacent possible yep. what's next the 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 um cat um nora bateson had a line the other day about be careful that in this particular metamorphosis we don't end up as a caterpillar with wings yeah yeah and that i think is is the problem we're facing is that we may end up with um, a paint job yeah. nothing Lip significantly Lip different. lipstick on the pig yeah and and that's and that's why what we were talking about earlier about uh, synecdoche and sort of uh, the ability for small digestible narratives to take over the larger worldview is super interesting. And Richard, any other thing, any other thoughts you have on that or, or other things? Um, I mean, I, we, the only, the, the only, the tactic for me, I think that we, is, is how do you, how do you disrupt uh, linguistic systems without causing angst? How do you cause laughter instead? Yeah. Um, that, that's key for me always. Well, this is yeah. where John Stewart, I mean, the, uh, five, 10 years ago, I put a thought in my brain that said, why are comedians our best journalists right now? I wrote a, I wrote an academic paper on that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and it was, and it was true. It was, like, was it our, funny? Was it funny? <laughs> Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> but it's crazy, right? Like, like yeah. the, the best analysis was coming yes. out of journalists studios, uh, yeah. sorry, out of comedian studios. Mm. Um, and it's nuts. So, so maybe there is a path for that. Yeah. I mean, and so, I mean, I argued that, that Stuart was, was really revealing the absurdities in modern life in a way that, that didn't necessarily offend everybody. It, the, yeah. it, it got people thinking. And the only, but the only, I don't see, so my, my challenge is, I think, you know, that Colbert was supposed to, to take over the Stuart mantle, but he's just become a, an anti-Trump kind of cliche now. Yeah. Uh, it, and, and the only, the, the people, with the person really with, with the crown is John Oliver. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that, that for me is where, you know, it tr it's true speaking to power in a way that doesn't necessarily. Yeah. And unfortunately, John Oliver is trapped, in his, is trapped in his format. Yes. John yes, Oliver yeah. has, has created a delivery mechanism that is a little prison of, his own, of its own, yeah. which yeah. is too bad. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't have the, 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 the playfulness that Stuart had. Um, right. So we sort of lost Stuart at the wrong time almost. Right. But also, Oliver's bite size now is 20 minutes on, mm. a partic on one topic at a time. Mm. And that just, like in, this, in the speedy world and the, and the small nugget world that we have, mm. it doesn't, it's not really working. Mm. Um, we should wrap our call. It's been phenomenal. Thank you. It's been a, a treat to, you. to explore this territory with you. Um, any and all afterthoughts, welcome. I'll put this recording on, on YouTube and uh, we can marvel over it 20 years from now when uh, the world is different. Let's hope so.
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you, Richard. Thank you for asking your question. No worries. Um, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, Michael, thank you for being here. Judy, thanks for, for joining. I'm sorry uh, that we didn't click in your calendar a little better early on, but here we it's are. Okay. I'll hear the recording and maybe drop some notes to people. That sounds great. And thank you. Thank you for another slice of Jerry. That was tremendous. Yeah. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Awesome. Thank thanks, guys. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.